Our next guests have a big announcement to make while they're here at the South by Southwest EDU. And we're gonna get the inside scoop. Please welcome Explore Media's CEO and founder, and full disclosure, my business partner, Ginny Bukos, and the News Movement's co-founder and editor-in-chief, Kamal Ahmed. Thank you for coming to the South by Southwest EDU studio. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Fantastic. I'm, I, I was very excited about your panel today because I know you have a big announcement, but for those who didn't get to make it there, since this is the live studio, can you please tell me about Explore and the news movement? Sure, I'll go first. Um, Explore, for the last 20 years, under a different name, um, more recently Explore has been creating under 10 minute content to help kids to grow up to be globally and culturally aware, um, and to learn about the world beyond their community, no matter how they define their community. Um, so. That's the, that's, it looks and feels exactly like a Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. So if you, you're a child and you know how to use one of those, and let's be honest, every three-year-old knows how to use Amazon, Netflix, <laughs> and Hulu, um, you have access to content that will spark curiosity and foster your imagination. I suppose the news movement, what's exciting for us, so the news movement, we're a new media organization about creating uh, great content that helps particularly younger audiences navigate the world. And you know that there's, a sort of ramp or a conveyor belt from college to university to your first job. It's sort of that adulting part of your life where you want to find out about the world and you want to be told about the, the world in ways you understand. And that's why the news movement and Explorer working together. Jenny, your business is all about engaging the next generation of students and our business is all about engaging the next generation of citizens and consumers and the next group of adults who will be running everything in the world for us in a number of years. And those two things together have really shown that we can have a great partnership. So you just kind of spilt the beans. Uh, <laughs> so what is your announcement? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go ahead. So the two of us are going to come together to create great content. Um, it is all about, there's a new ecology of content creation coming. We know that when I was young, many years ago, frankly, uh, the content that I could consume was incredibly limited and done at the behest of the producers of that content. So I had maybe four TV channels and a newspaper in the morning and a bit of radio. That was kind of it. Now, if I think about my daughter, who is 22, and my son, who is 19, they have a million pieces of content distributed to them every hour of every day. And also, they can create it themselves. That means the whole content creation business is changing hugely. And that means that all of us that are engaged in helping people navigate the world and uh, enable them to have an empowered life full of opportunity, the content needs to change for them. And working with Jenny and Explore and Jenny's teams with the news movement, thinking intensely about how we tell those stories differently so people can understand the big issues of the day about themselves, about adulting, about making that journey into adult life. By coming together and bringing together the great skills of Explore and the great skills of the news movement in this new content creation ecology, we're going to make a huge impact. Our business is US, UK, but the world actually is our audience. Yeah. And in addition to like the breaking news stuff that we're talking about and creating content together, you also have, um, even though you've only been around for two years, you have some um, longer format stuff that really starts to address like social emotional learning. Um, we, we just debuted today um, a series on racism and equity in sport for women. Um, so there's, there's longer format stuff that can be aligned to things that teachers are already teaching, the core standards they're already teaching, but it's content that kids are interested in because they're already talking about it and there's not really a place for them to find something that's appropriate for them um, that can be taught within the classroom model. Um, so it'll be new content creation and then sharing each other's libraries um, for each other's respective audiences, um, which is really exciting. It's, I mean, can you explain a little bit of how it's implemented in the classroom other than just watching? Um, our content or our joint content? Yes. Okay, so the, <laughs> the piece we debuted today is um, with uh, Team Great Britain's first black Olympic 
female swimmer. Um, and we've taken that beautiful three minute piece that you did that talked a little bit about her journey, some of the racism in the sport, and then myths in the sport around like black people not being able to swim. Um, the idea of there was only one size swim cap until about three or four years ago. So like Afro-Caribbean hair wasn't even taken into consideration. Bringing that three minute video into the classroom with a lesson plan that standards aligned. So a teacher watches that with the classroom for three to five minutes. And then there's an entire knowledge to action uh, curriculum. So what do you want a student to do after they've consumed this three minutes? Not just regurgitate a fact, but what do you want them to actually go out and do? Is it a design challenge where they design a different type of swim cap? Is it addressing uh, myths in sports? Um, so what is it we want them to do? So it all runs on the platform that way, but very practical information on how to align it to what teachers already have to teach. So it cuts down on prep time because they already have a discussion ready Zero to go. Zero prep time. Plug and play. And it was, it's interesting that going on that journey with Jenny, this was a piece that we, one of the first pieces we produced as a, as a new young business, we were just based in London then, now we've got offices in New York uh, as well, is to see that repurposed, that journey that Alice Deering, this amazing woman of colour in the UK, who, as uh, Jenny said, was the first person of colour to swim with Team GB in um, the Olympics, to see that repurposed for younger people. We put it together for Generation Z, that's 18 to 25, to, so that they could see how a different view of equity really matters to, um, to them, and that motivated their engagement with our piece. But then to see it repurposed for the next generation below Gen Z, that's Gen Alpha, it's fantastic. Yeah. So what's Gen Alpha? What's what's the age range right there? <laughs> this so has been under a little bit of controversy in my house. So. Yeah, so I would say, so as I say, my, my, my children, 22, 19, they are Gen Z heartland. I would say Gen Alpha is sort of 8 to 18 is how I view it. But I think, Jenny, you may have a slightly different cohort. It's basically the, the group that's below 18, the next coming Absolutely. Group. Yeah. So how do you tell the story differently for Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Millennials? Like, how, What's the difference in the storytelling? I think there are some, maybe not a huge amount actually. I think that uh, there is this huge shift which actually we think will encourage many generations to have a look at content in a different way. I think there are things that we're learning about how Generation Z consumes content that actually good for millennials, good for Generation X like me, and good for Generation Alpha. I think when we're talking about Explore's specific younger audience, I think we would step a little bit more strongly into very simple storytelling, which for Generation Z who are that much older, they would probably want a slightly different tone and feel to it because I think you've got to take the fact that uh, demographics have been on a journey. What's the last thing you want when you're 21? To think you're consuming something that's for a 13 year old, mm. even if you secretly quite like it. <laughs> you don't want to be told that. So I think it's in the branding, the tone, the feel. We will look a little more adult. And Jenny, I mean, yeah. you know, how would you then think about that for the, um, the age groups that you communicate with? So for a lot of the age groups we communicate, with, it's teens and tweens. So it's really like, it's not little kids. It's just as kids are like sort of thinking who do they want to be in the world and how do they want to have, leave, you know, have an impact on the world. So the themes are pretty much the same. So when, we've, when, we, when we were talking about this partnership, things like financial literacy, that's just as important for adults as it is for like a 13 year old. Um, so the, the content is the same, you're right, it's just, it's just the tone. And then framing it with curriculum allows the space for questions, conversations, where you wouldn't get that in your version of the newsfeed. You wouldn't have that. Uh, but a lot of our stuff is co-viewing as well. It sparks conversations in your household. So it is designed to entertain parents as well and teachers. Like nobody, no teacher wants to put on a video that's boring. They want to be entertained as well. Um, look at Sesame Street. Sesame Street did that so, so brilliantly. I know y you have a daughter. You were entertained by the people they brought on Sesame Street and some of the things they did. Some of the jokes only you got. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, there are ways to do it. It's very nuanced. Um, but I, I think 
you know, kids are smart enough yeah. to consume the news. I think it's this, it's sort of this conveyor belt where there's a huge change between what you might consume in a school environment and then suddenly being presented with the news. Mm -hmm. That is a huge gap between those two things. And we're working with Explore and then working with our media partners like the Associated Press, for example, to find a space in between what uh, Jenny's uh, business is doing and the sort of super grown-up news that we see every day on television. There's a big gap in there for different types of storytelling. So how are kids consuming? How is Z and Alpha consuming their news currently? It is certainly different because if you imagine, you know, social media channels, there is a vernacular to those platforms, which is really important you understand. Nothing worse than appearing on these new platforms and not seeming to understand what the platform needs or wants or what's the tone. And the tone of Instagram is completely different from the tone of TikTok. It's completely different from the tone of YouTube Shorts or Snapchat. And having that understanding of the vernacular shows that you're with Generation Z, not about them. I think the, the, the way that you can be seen to be really inauthentic is the classic, you know, dad dancing at this kid's disco. <laughs> he thinks he looks good, but yes. the kids are just, yeah. oh my goodness me, he doesn't know what he's doing here. And it's just embarrassing and it's all a bit awkward. You need to turn up authentically. And that means for our business, average age of our newsroom is 25. We are driven by young people, by the way they, friends finding out together, they look like the platforms they appear on because they live there. We go to where our audience is, but also our audience is also my colleagues now that I work with every day. So how important is representation on your platforms for people who are communicating the news to look like their audience? Hugely 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 important you have to be intentional every day if you think about what are the real motivating factors for generation z we did a lot of deep audience research before we started this business and during uh, the growth of the news movement and our other social media channel um, the recount which looks at politics in america equity um, uh, being inclusive of all points of view, empowering voices that aren't traditionally empowered by much of what is described as the traditional media. If you can show intentionally that you understand that driving motivation about equity and integrity, whether that's about climate change and the global south versus the global north, whether it's about race, whether it's about gender, whether it's about anything where young people see inequity, that shows that you can be genuine on those uh, platforms. And if you can show that every day in the people you hire, in what you look like on the platforms, I think that's a vital part of this new ecology of news and content creation, which is not just about the news industry, it's actually about brands, it's about um, NGOs, it's about nonprofits, it's about all the communication is changing so rapidly because of the social media revolution. Yeah, so you ask about representation. We did a study a few years ago, and there have been other studies. One third of teens and tweens don't see themselves reflected. And that's not just in, in any type of media they consume, be that books, be that television. And there have been a lot of advancements in like fictional storytelling that have changed that, but not so much in factual programming. Um, and if I have time for a little story, this is how much representation matters. So yes. we have a, a mutual friend, uh, Jeremy, who's probably watching, and I don't want to embarrass him too much. And he has, a, he has a, a, a teenage daughter. And when she was four, she was allowed to ask any questions she wanted before she went to bed. And because she's a smart kid, she knows that the harder the question, the longer she can stay up. <laughs> so she asked a question, if all the people on the earth could fit in the earth. And, and that's kind of a strange question, because she said, if they could all fit in, then I can go like this. And I can break the earth apart and then go to space and then I can be an astronaut. And Jeremy said to his daughter, well, you can already be an astronaut. And she said, no, I can't because look at all my books about astronauts. They're all men. And that's why representation matters. Because at four years old, this girl thought that whole career path is cut off because she never saw it. So that's so core to everything we do to make sure that every child can see their story, their experience, their community, who they are represented in what we do. How important is it to not underestimate your audience? I, I feel like some kids' content is, it, it seems younger than what you might expect. Um, we've, 
in the 20 years we've been doing this, when I've worked with not people within our business, but external content creators, they're like, oh, it's it, it's just dumbed down. I'm like, it's not dumbed down, it's simplified. And what's the, the, the string, the narrative thread you wanna pull out of this video? You can't do, let's teach the history of communism in 10 minutes, but what's one thing that we can teach from the Cold War? Um, understanding that kids don't understand the Cold War, they actually think it's cold. Uh, <laughs> so they're just little, little things um, that you can do. But kids are also surrounded by adult topics all day long. So when something happens in Ukraine and you're around an eight-year-old, they are gonna ask you questions. Like, what's happening? Why are people leaving their homes? Why is there a war? Why can't they solve it? So like, lean into that. Kids are super smart. I think it's so right. So you should be simple, but never simplistic. You never underestimate your audience's intelligence, but never overestimate their knowledge. They may not know much about the specifics, but they're clever. And so it's about starting where they are. So when we've done coverage of Ukraine, we've done coverage of the events in Iran, we've done coverage of you know deep political issues that are going on around the world. And as long as you allow people to join the story, series one, episode one, not series six, you know, episode seven, when they haven't watched the first five series, if you allow them to start there, they will come on a journey with you. So when we did our first Ukraine video before the invasion by Russia, we genuinely and literally explained where is Ukraine? because yeah. that was the question being asked by the audience. We then went on a pretty rapid journey about what was actually going on, but you start where the audience is, and I think you're absolutely right. If you get that wrong, and you are patronizing, and you are simplistic rather than simple, the audience will turn away, because no one wants to be taught down to. So when you're storytelling, how do you make it relatable to the audience? I mean, these are big, huge concepts. How do you explain the Ukraine war to a 13-year-old? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we don't have a video like that yet. Um, I think understanding who your audience is 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 step one um, for us because we have a 20-year history of working with schools not just in the U.S. but globally. Um, we oftentimes when we're going to do a near, new series put out on social media we're covering um, the health of our oceans. What are you interested in? And we do get teachers and parents and kids that come back to us. So that's that's relatability right there. Um, also, it's it's up to the teacher a lot to look at the video and we can give them a roadmap on how you bring that into the classroom but a classroom in New York City is going to look different than a classroom in Nebraska that's going to look different than a, a classroom in Texas so it's up to the teacher to understand like the experience and the shared experience of their community before deploying that in the classroom I've always appreciated the fact that when you're telling a big story you tell it through one person I, um, uh, well, I, I was part of this episode, but you're talking about refugee camps in Berlin, and you told the story of one nine-year-old girl and her experience, and when my daughter at the time was the same age watched that episode, she didn't care that it was me. She cared that there was a nine-year-old who plays with her phone, and she plays with her phone, and she's playing Roblox, and she, like, she felt a relatability that made her empathetic. Yeah. I loved that. About we, your story we talked about that today, and, and last year, the UNHCR classified 30 million people as refugees. Not internally displaced, not my, 30 million refugees. How do you even begin to address that with kids? You can't comprehend how many people 30 million is. It's the population of Australia. That's how much we're talking. And wow. if you say that, a kid still can't comprehend it. One person, one story. Yeah, I think person. that's the thing. You've nailed it there. It's about finding something that connects the story to the to the audience by having one person. So for Ukraine, we, for example, did things like dating and clubbing in a war, but it got you into the Whoa. story in the right way. It started you in a different place, but that's what I do. So I understood the journey that I was then on. And you almost sometimes the news comes later. You start with the great story and then the news comes later. And I think that's a very good technique for engaging people in really important information. All right, final question. Who are both of your role models that brought you to the place that you are today? Whoa. Jenny. Wow. Desmond <laughs> Tutu. Really, really simple for me. Um, he was one of the first people I interviewed and um, 
he was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so during apartheid, um, after the fall of apartheid, they knew they couldn't prosecute everyone who had been convicted of crimes. So they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where you would come forward and tell your story and ask forgiveness of the community, and I listened to all of these. Um, and he wrote a book called No Future Without Forgiveness, and that's how I think about everything I do in my life is um, how can I forgive people? How can I be better? How can I reach out to like my fellow human beings? So that's the number one person who inspires what I do. Well, that's amazing, Jenny. Mine is not <laughs> as famous, but was a great leader. He was the editor of the Observer newspaper, the world's oldest Sunday newspaper. He taught me how to think about reinventing the news to really engage new people. And frankly, he took a bet on a person of color when there weren't many people of color in the media. When I first started out, Roger Alton was his name, and he was always and still is a hero to me. Well, now you guys are role models to the next generation. So thank you for coming to the EDU studio. It was so nice to have you here. I'm really glad we got to have this conversation. So those who did not come to your panel still got to be a part of it. So thank you for that amazing conversation, all of you. That's it from the studio today. I'm your host, Carrie Byron, and we will be back tomorrow with Olympic gold medalist Christy Yamaguchi and much, much more. You can find a complete schedule of our upcoming interviews at schedule.sxswedu.com. So long for now. I'll see you tomorrow right here.